Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gives us His grace and His peace in proportion to the amount that we give Him our heart. He gives us His grace and His peace in proportion to the heart that we give to Him. Some people say, I just don't have that peace. I haven't found that peace yet. What part of your heart are you holding back from Him? You see people who are going through the most terrible circumstances you can imagine. I mean, I think back to King David and some of the things he went through. Being on the run, chased down for his life, uh, going through sins of his own. So many things that were happening in his life. And yet you read the Psalms and it's just beautiful. The outpouring and the way that he saw God and, and found strength in God through it all. Why? Because he was a man after God's own heart. He had grace and peace in proportion to the heart that he laid out there before God. And God will give us his grace and his peace as we give him our hearts. Uh, it, it is funny how you get certain things on the brain. Have you ever noticed that you might never see a certain thing, you know, just as you walk through your life, you're completely unaware of something until one day you see it and you're like, oh, oh yeah, I remember that. And then that week you'll see it like four more times. H haven't run across this particular thing in years and years. You completely forgot about it. And then all of a sudden it's in your face everywhere you go. It's just funny how it works out that way. Um, this, this past week we've been talking about these small groups. And uh, so I've been seeing this uh, skyline of Jerusalem every time I, I think about Trent and Teresa's group. And then I went over to uh, Miss Libby's the other day and she had her pictures of Israel laid out there on, on the counter. And, and I'm remembering back to 2004. 14, Priscilla and I had the, the blessing to go over to the Holy Land and, and walk around and see all these things. And, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm being flooded back with that again, thinking about Israel, thinking about the Holy Land. That's just been on my, on my mind this week. And if you go there today, if you go take a 10-day tour or whatever uh, it happens to be, there's one site that you're, you're more than likely going to see. I mean, everybody has to see these few very important sites. And if you go over today and take a tour, you're most likely going to see uh, this one that is, there it is, uh, not clicking for me very well this morning. This is the Wailing Wall. It's known as the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. Uh, this is the ruins of what's left of the western wall of the temple complex. It's a site that still attracts 8 million visitors every single year. And, uh, and you can kind of see there's larger stones down on the bottom. Uh, let's see if this will work. Yeah, it will. Uh, larger stones down here on, on the bottom several layers and then some smaller ones up here. It's kind of been built and torn down and rebuilt and torn down over the years. Uh, but there's, there's people that come all all day long to pray. They come to mourn uh, because of the, the fact that they haven't had their temple in thousands of years. God, their meeting place with God has been taken from them. It's almost like God Himself has been taken from them. God, when are you going to return and shine your face back upon your people and give us back our temple and, and meet with us there in your fullness again? Uh, they can still follow God. They can still worship God. But, but the Jews, they miss so much without their temple. And so they have this last vestige of the temple that they come to regularly. You'll see there, um, if you can make it out, the cracks seem to have something white there in them in, uh, between the stones. People come and they, they write little prayers. And they shove those prayers into the cracks. They're just covered. The whole wall you walk down and you see prayers in every crack and they'll collect those periodically and they'll burn them kind of as an incense offering uh, to God. It's a profound, profound sight. Any picture that I have of this wall is taken telescopically uh, because it's, it's not allowed to take a camera up towards the wall. This, this is kind of irreverent and, and they don't like you to do that. But I, I was able to find a video online. If you were to go to this wall, this is very accurate what you would see and what you would hear uh, uh, or, or experience there at that wall. So let me, let me play this video and then we'll continue to talk about it.
such a profound sight. Um, some of the things that you notice, people kissing the wall, um, people pressing the Torah against their face as they pray. Uh, they, they have this sense uh, of, of the holiness of God, that, that, that they long from the heart for God, and, and they, they revere and, and they, they, love, they, they would just kiss the wall of His temple, what's left of it, the ruins. They just they long for it so deeply. It's a very, um, very imposing, very massive, very holy uh, site there in Jerusalem. And, and it really it just chills me to think of the fact that it's just the leftovers. I mean, it's just the, the crumbles of what it used to be. This massive, imposing, holy site where I mean, you walk into this place, and you read the Bible when they went to the temple. How, I mean, you, you touch the wrong thing and you're dead. I mean, you go in at the wrong time and the wrong way and you're dead. Why? It's not because God is mean. It's not because God like, has these rules that He wrote down and He's waiting. Oh, somebody touched something wrong, dead. And He's just he's waiting. No, he's not a mean God. It's He's as holy as He is and He cannot be any less holy than He is. It's a dangerous thing for an unholy person to bump around in the hot spot of God's holiness. That's why all the rules. That's why God said, I want you to be in my presence. I want to commune with you, but we've got to have some rigid boundary guidelines because if you bump into my holiness, that's it. And that was this place. It's just amazing, amazing to think about. And you'll see this and much, much more if you sign up for Trent and Teresa's Israel group, which is in the back right now, um, promo. But anyway, I, I want you to kind of walk with me for a second. Uh, in your mind's eye, you know, back to that, uh, I don't want to go back over the video again, but if you could kind of get back in your mind's eye, that, that front view where we saw the wall, if you were to go up to that wall, which is the western wall, and you would take a right hand turn, and we walk all the way down to the tip, where we're at the southwest corner of the wall. If we, if we took a left hand turn and we kept going around the temple complex, we would head right east into the Mount of Olives. That's where we are right here in this picture. Kind of looking back up north, you know, the, the Wailing Wall is just kind of over this mound right here. We're looking back up that way. Well, what you're seeing here is a site that they've excavated known as the Teropian Street. This street would have been uh, present in Jesus' day. All of this is part of Herod's temple complex, kind of inside, outside the court. The temple wall is, right, is what you're seeing right here on the right side. Uh, very interesting, this mound of rocks right here was actually thrown down by the Jews. That was some destruction they did on their own temple when the Romans were attacking in A.D. 70. They were throwing down these massive stones from the top of the temple uh, and trying not to be overtaken. Uh, but here on the left hand side, kind of where you see all these soldiers congregated here, you'll see these little stalls. Eight by eight by eight, basically, these stone stalls. These are, these are ancient market stalls. And as you're looking at this right here, I want to kind of fill it in with something that happened right there in that place about 2,000 years ago. It says, The Passover of the Jews was, hand, was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their, t their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your house will consume me. Very interesting. They're remembering Psalm 69. You can go over and, and read Psalm 69 right now. If you read it in the Jewish Bible of today, the English translated Jewish Bible where they've taken it right out of the text in Hebrew, the way they translate it, zeal for your house has become my undoing. Jesus is going to eventually end up on a cross because of His passion for God. His zeal for God is going to be His undoing. But He runs these guys out. And to be fair, there was a legitimate reason for them to be there. 
It, it didn't start wrong. It started right. Say you're coming from Galilee and you're coming to temple to make a sacrifice. And you sacrifice a lamb or, or what have you. It's a whole lot more advantageous to get a lamb once you get there. To, to go walk yourself to Jerusalem and then buy a lamb in Jerusalem as opposed to leading a lamb all the way from Galilee and if it stumbles, if it breaks a leg, if it becomes blemished in any way, there goes your sacrifice. And so they had stalls where you could buy pigeons or lambs or whatever you needed to sacrifice. It was a legitimate thing. Uh, another thing, Jesus himself, he would tell them on one occasion that the coinage, whose image does that coin bear? And they would say back to him, Caesar's. The, the coinage of the day had Caesar's image on it, which the Jews considered an abomination for you to go into the temple and pay the temple tax with the image of Caesar. And so you actually had Roman coinage and you had Hebrew coinage. And so you had money changers. They were there to take your Roman coin and give you the Jewish equivalent so that you could pay your temple tax. It's, it's all legitimate. There was a good reason for these guys to be there in the beginning. But as the years go by and they start to operate more along the lines of greed and, and, and trying to uh, prop up their business more than they're propping up the kingdom of God and they're expanding their trade, at some point it went south. And so on two different occasions you have here in John 2 that I just read at the outset of Jesus' ministry and also Matthew 21 near the end of Jesus' ministry, uh, Jesus comes and He runs all these guys out of the street. Jesus got angry. Jesus was angry. Now it's not anger in the sense that maybe you've experienced your own anger. It's not an out of control anger. Jesus is very deliberate. It says He made a whip of cords and then drove them out. Do you know how long it takes to make a whip of cords? I just imagine Jesus kind of propped over against a stone pillar over there weaving these things together. Very deliberate, very even headed. But He was passionate about the glory of God. He was passionate about the holiness of God. And, and what we see here is Jesus taking His ministry as the Messiah very seriously. What was His role? What was His calling? It was to call the people back to God. It was to cleanse, you know, we call this the cleansing of the temple. This is more aptly said, the cleansing of the people. Jesus is cleansing the hearts of His people because He finds them inadequate. He, he finds them distracted. He finds them focused on their own greed and their own business and themselves instead of the temple where you bump into the wrong thing and you're dead. The holiness of God was here, but they did not see it. And so Jesus, He's, he's trying to turn the hearts of the people back to their God. That's His ministry as the Messiah. But the sad fact is, you go over to Matthew 21, the second time He does this, and you just go forward a day, a day or two, into Matthew 23, Matthew 24, and um, Jesus finally has to announce the bankruptcy of this temple. Matthew 23 and 37, He's weeping now. He's lamenting now. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you weren't willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Your house is empty. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these things, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon the other which will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? He said, See, your house is left to you desolate, empty, abandoned, of no value. It has no worth in it. Your house is now desolate. The temple was the holy place where a perfect holy God met with His broken people. He made a clean space there in Jerusalem, a place where God could meet with man and, and come in contact with His broken creation. But the only reason that that temple was holy was because a holy God was in it. 
There was nothing about the stones. There was nothing about the site. It was the holy God that made the temple holy. And here we find the glory of the Lord take on flesh. And God walks into His own temple, the place that was made for Him. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And they are so blind, they continue to show reverence for the building while rejecting the Lord that the building was made for. And that's the point at which Jesus says, your house is desolate. Your house is left to you empty and abandoned. And Jesus physically walks out of the temple. God leaves His temple and He goes to the Mount of Olives, the mountain to the east of the city. I think the main thought that, that, that we want to impress on our hearts this morning is that Jesus knows and Jesus cares whether the glory of the Lord is the center of attention in His house or not. Jesus knows and Jesus cares whether His glory is the center of attention in the house or it is not. Jesus knew it wasn't. Jesus walked into this house and He could tell, you, you love this temple but you don't love Me. The glory of the Lord you give no honor to, but, but yourselves you give honor to in this place. Jesus knows we do church in the same way all too often. Where we come to it for self-righteousness. I'm better than other people because I go to church and they don't. I, I come to soothe my conscience. I, I know I carry guilt because I'm a, I'm a sinful person, but when I go to church I feel better about myself. Whatever I can get out of it, Jesus knows we run the same risk that they did where the glory of the Lord is not the center of attention in His own house. When Jesus left that house desolate, He knew that they'd focus too much on the externals, the rituals, the, the building itself, the, the checking the box of the worship things that they were supposed to do. He knew that they were so focused on all those things that he, they did not even know when God left the house. Isn't that tragic? There, there's a story in the Old Testament about Samson. When Samson was so used to having the glory of the Lord upon him, the Spirit of the Lord filled him up, and whenever he needed it was there, and he would charge into battle, and he would just, I mean, he would decimate the enemy. And there was this one time where Samson just runs out like he always does, but the saddest verse, Samson didn't know the Lord wasn't with him anymore. These people were in this holy place, but they did not even know the moment that God left the holy place, and they were just sitting inside a building at that point. The important question I need to ask myself this morning is, if God left the house, would I even know it? Could I tell the difference? Do I know what it looks like for God to inhabit a house versus not inhabit a house because I'm so focused on things other than the presence of God? Jesus knows, and Jesus cares. What's so fascinating to me about the Bible if you want to go over to Ezekiel with me, Ezekiel chapter 8, 600 years before Jesus does all these things, God has already illustrated them in detail in Ezekiel chapter 8. 600 years before Jesus does all these things, we're going to read the same exact story. In, in a, it's going to have a different covering on it, but it's going to be the same exact story in Ezekiel chapter 8. We don't have time to do it in, in detail, but, but this, this is such a fascinating parallel you just have to see it here. Uh, Ezekiel 8 comes to us in about 592 B.C. Jerusalem is destroyed completely in 586 B.C. So we're talking about six years difference. This is six years before the destruction of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is taken in waves. It's, it's, it's finally destroyed in 586, but the captives go in waves, and Ezekiel himself is already in Babylon. So he's already a captive, and he's going to catch a vision that's going to explain two things. It's, it's going to explain, Ezekiel, why are you in Babylon? Why are Jews already being captured? Why are we already losing? And it's also going to foretell a little bit, here's the rest of the story. Over the next six years, here's the judgment that God is going to bring upon His holy city. So that's, that's Ezekiel 8. And, and it's, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, the vision is kind of funny. God just picks Ezekiel up by his hair. And he drags him back from Babylon all the way to the temple in Jerusalem. And he's going to show him some things there in the temple in Jerusalem. Ezekiel 8 and verse 5. He said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now towards the north. So I lifted up my eyes toward the north. And behold, north of the altar gate in the entrance 
was this image of jealousy. So, so God takes Ezekiel by the hair, puts him back in the temple, says, I want you to look over there in my temple courts. And what you see is this image. He's showing him that someone has set up an idol in the temple courts. Now, historically, this had actually happened. King Manasseh had put up a Baal in the temple. He later took it down. I don't know what Ezekiel is seeing right now. Maybe he's kind of seeing a vision of the past when that Baal was standing right there in the temple. Maybe something like that is going on right now in 592. But, but Ezekiel is seeing this image in God's temple. Idolatry in God's house. Verse 6, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here to drive me far from my sanctuary. But you will see still greater abominations. And he brought me to the entrance of the court. And when I looked, behold, there was a hole in the wall. This is so Indiana Jones to me. There was a hole in the wall. And then he said to me, Son of man, dig in the wall. So I dug in the wall and behold, there was an entrance. And he said to me, go in. And see the vile abominations that they're committing there. So I went in and saw, and there, engraved on the wall and all around, was every form of creeping things and loathsome beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel. This is so Indiana. I love this. It's just like, you know, if you watched the National Treasure with Nicolas Cage or some, one of these just excavation adventure stories, he, he, he brings Ezekiel into the temple and he says, Look here, you see this image, but that wasn't even half of it. He says, Come over here, there's this little hole in the wall. I want you to dig. And, and, and Ezekiel starts digging, and then all of a sudden there's this secret entrance. And you go in the secret entrance, and the idolatry is just on a level you wouldn't believe. All around, all these vile things that my people are actually worshiping in my house. And I just want to stop there and say, Jesus knows, God knows all the little secret entrances in your heart, in my heart. We, we can wall it up pretty good. I can fool you. You can fool me. That's not even the point, but we can do it to where it, you, you don't even see what's going on there. But, but God, the one who built the house, who want, the one who knows the house inside and out, like this is my house, this is my sanctuary, He knows all the secret little entrances. He knows how to dig in and see what's really going on in our hearts. He knows how to, uh, how to excavate it. Ezekiel 9, uh, this vision continues. God brings a judgment over Jerusalem because of this idolatry that's happening there in His house. Ezekiel 10, the glory of the Lord detaches from the temple. He kind of rises up into the air above the temple. He's getting ready to leave. And in Ezekiel chapter 11, the Lord is hovering above the temple and He starts to pronounce judgments over the temple. All throughout chapter 11 until we get to verse 23. Finally in Ezekiel 11 and 23, it said, The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. And just to be clear geographically, the Mount of Olives is the mountain that is on the east side of the city. Now, it, this is fascinating. Ma Matthew 24, you read Matthew 21 through 24, you read how Jesus walks up into his temple and he begins to expose and excavate and bring out the idolatry that's there in his very temple. They're not worshiping the glory of the Lord, they're worshiping themselves. And he walks into the temple and he exposes their hypocrisy right there in plain sight. And he begins to pronounce judgments. Matthew 23, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, woe to you scribes and Pharisees. He begins to pronounce judgments there in the temple courts. And then he proclaims, your house is left to you desolate. The glory of, the glory of God leaves the temple and he goes out to the mountain east of the city. Jesus does and sits down on the Mount of Olives. Fascinating. Fascinating. I wonder how many people caught it. Oh yeah, 600 years ago Ezekiel said something very similar to all this. Paul wrote, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? And as I read Ezekiel, and as I read Matthew, the question comes to me that when God digs into my heart, what does He see? When God digs into all the little hidden recesses of my heart, what does He see there? I can fool you. You can fool me. 
We can make, really, make it look really good from the outside. But my heart, your heart, is the temple that God made with His own hands. He knows it inside and out, and He knows and He cares when He is the center of attention in His own temple. What does He see? What does He see when He, he, he sees my worship? When God sees my worship, what does He see? I, I'm down here singing the songs. I'm praying the prayers. I've got the bread. I've got the cup. I'm doing all the things. But what does God see in my heart when He sees my worship? Does He see an open heart? Does He see an outpouring of faith from my heart? Does He see an outpouring of love from my heart? A hungering and a thirsting for righteousness. Does He see a poverty of spirit when He sees my worship? Or does He see indifference? Does He see distraction? Does he see the fact that I'm already planning out what we're going to cook this evening and that I'm paying the bills and I'm, I'm just kicking myself in the pants for that stupid thing I said two days ago? I'm a dozen other places in my headspace right now other than right here. I'm in the throne room of God, but I'm not in the throne room of God. What does God see when he sees my worship? What does God see when he sees my relationships? I mean, I present myself as a person that cares about other people, that invests in other people, looks out for the interests of other people. But, but what does God see? Does God see a true selfless love of others? Does God see compassion? Does He see mercy? Does He see hopefulness for others? Or does He see the fact that there's only one person in the world I care about, me, myself, and I? Does He see me judging everybody else up and down? What does God see in my heart? Because He can dig into the very hidden recesses of my heart. You can't, I can't, but He can. And He sees everything. Can I encourage us to take these texts home with us this week and ask these questions to God openly? He will answer. He knows. He alone knows. He alone can answer. Honestly and fearlessly, may I ask my God this week, God, what do you see in me? What do you see in me? I'll tell you this, and you already know this, He already knows. We're not asking Him to do an investigation and find something that He hadn't already found. What we do to ourselves, though, we fool ourselves. We don't want to know. We don't want to see what He sees. I, I, just, I have this general anxiety that God's back there seeing all these things in me that I wish He wouldn't, but I don't dare turn around and look at it myself. But would we have the faith, the fearless, bold faith, to join in with Him? God, show me what you see. Because the fact is, my, my salvation, my, my trust, my faith, it doesn't line up with my accomplishments. I know. I know I'm not going to heaven because of what I've done. I know I'm not going to heaven because of what I've avoided doing. I know I'm going to heaven because He loves me. And I know that if He wants to excavate, excavate my heart, I know that if He wants to expose things in my heart, it's not to condemn me. It's to help me. Because those are the things that are killing me. Those are the things that are stealing life from me. That are, that are tearing me away from Him. And He wants to expose it. Why did Jesus walk into this temple and turn over those tables and expose the hypocrisy? Was it mean-spirited? Was it because He just wanted, I want to see you get caught. I want to see everybody know what a phony you are. No, that's not what He did it for. He did it because He loved them. And He wanted to expose the darkness so that He could bring them into the light. Would I join in with Him in that very same discovery? God, show me the darkness so that I might join you in the light. When I open my heart to Him, when I open all of His house to Him, God, what do you see in me? I want you to create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, oh God. I want you to give me a pure heart. I want you to pray with me. Father God, we love you and we know, we know our brokenness and our sinfulness. Father, we know that you know all things. We know that you know us inside and out. But Father, this world has trained us to think of that as a bad thing. We run from you. Like we run from a policeman when we've been caught doing something wrong. We, we run from you because we don't want to get in trouble not understanding that you're pursuing us out of love, not out of condemnation. You're drawing us into your presence, not so that you can have us closer, that you might punish us, that you might have, have us closer, that you might heal us, and that you might build us up, and that you might tear away all these things that are truly punishing us, our sins. 
Father, teach us to run to you and not from you. Father, teach us to love your way of exposing our hearts, getting down into the truth of who we are and what we have down in the depths of our souls. Father, teach us to love your process of excavating us and then rebuilding us after your image. We know that there's health there, that there is life there, that there is joy there where you are showing us who we are and remaking who we are. Father, teach us, truly teach us, that we are not justified by our good deeds or our lack of bad ones, but we are justified by our grace, by our faith in you. When we know your love, when we know your salvation, we know the truth that it's not our deeds, it's your deeds. Teach us that, Father. Teach us that in our minds, teach us that in our hearts. And Father, I'm, I'm just so grateful that as we ask these things, we know that we receive them uh, individually and we receive them in community. That we have a community of like-minded people who do life together and we support one another. We don't bring condemnation against one another, we bring encouragement to each other. Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for this community and the way that you're building your, your kingdom of light here in this very community. We're so honored that you would take us and that you would use us in that building effort. Father, we're, we're just, we're so grateful. And we look to you, we trust you. And we pray now together as a church family. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.